Welcome to Community Conversations, where we will be bringing you fascinating discussions with local leaders about topics that everybody is talking about. I'm Dr. Cinder Sinclair, and I will be your host. Our special guest is Roy Lee, who was recently elected to the Board of Supervisors representing District 1. Welcome, Roy. Hey, Cinder. Thank you for having me here. Oh, gosh. We have a lot to learn about Roy. <laughs> All right, so um, let's start with this. So Roy, I know that you own and operate uh, Uncle Chen Restaurant in Carpinteria. Yes. You have a family mm -hmm. and uh, you are currently serving and have for the last like six years as city council member yes. for the city of Carpinteria. So Roy, how did you decide to run for Board of Supervisors with all that going on? Huh. The same way when I uh, decided to run for city council. Uh, being at the restaurant every day, you hear about the complaints, the issues that your customers tell you about. So over time, I, I want to do more. I wanted to solve those issues that our residents have uh, about cannabis, about housing, homelessness, and mental health. I wanted to address that, and I was not happy in our current representation, so I decided to run. So here you were, working at your restaurant every day, every day. Yep. And People started talking. Now, some people could have just ignored that, but no. You listened, you paid attention, and you cared enough to want to do something about it. I did, and it's a huge undertaking, right? Nobody asked me to run, no group, no person. I went in by myself and uh, applied and started collecting signatures. Um, it was a huge, huge step, but I was confident that I was able to do it. So when you say nobody asked you to run, for council, for, for Board of Supervisors? And yeah. council, yeah. I just okay. want to do it because I wanted to serve. Just because you wanted to do it. You saw a need. Yes. And you said, okay. You stepped up and said, you can count on me. I'm going to give it my best shot. I did. I did. I, uh, oh, I first asked my wife if I could do it. Oh, smart so, man. So <laughs> she gave the approval and then um, I did it. Well, good. And so... When you look back at this last, you know, several months, what has surprised you about the race or deciding to be supervisor, that sort of thing? The div diversity of the community, uh, not just the first district, but the whole county. When you go out knocking on doors, giving people a call, there's much more issues that you hear about um, besides cannabis and about housing. And there's flooding on the west side. There's fire concerns in Montecito and up at Riviera and Mission Canyon. And in some land, they want to be heard, they want better representation. Mm -hmm. So there's so much diverse needs and wants that I have learned throughout. Uh, it's been a year now since I started campaigning. So, wow. Gosh. So, all right, so now you decided you're gonna run for Board of Supervisors, District 1. Yes. And what, you just started knocking on doors so you could hear, I'm, I'm really impressed, you know how important it is to listen, to ask questions and then listen. And so there you were, what, knocking on doors? And how, what kind of reception did you get? It actually turns out campaigning at the restaurant was the most effective. Oh. Because we get, say, 100 customers a day times 300 plus days. So you reach a big audience. Um, that worked for me, and I was glad to uh, undertake that. Gosh, so, so you did a lot of your cam campaigning at the restaurant. I mean, that makes sense because here, the very people who you hear every day are coming in, and new people, no doubt, and you're once again listening to what they say. It is. Uh, I'm a better listener than a talker. I think listening is more important because you need to understand what the other people are saying. And campaigning at the restaurant, you can have your signs. You can have campaign materials. Oh. And you give people a chance to come and see you when they want to. Mm -hmm. You don't have the necessary uh, knock on their door when they're doing something, whether it's you know, um, having dinner, reading, and otherwise. So I was available uh, from 10 o'clock in the morning till about 9 o'clock at night, every single day. So do you think the word got around? Oh. Hey, if you, have, uh, if you want to find out more about Roy, this, this new guy that's running for a supervisor, go over to the restaurant and 
and talk to him. Do you think the word just got around and more people started coming? Yes, yes, he did. And also, I went out to uh, held uh, events at various places in Santa Barbara, okay. in Summerland. That way, for people who don't want to break the traffic, which is it's been challenging, yeah. I go I go to them. Okay, so tell me about those events. Where where did you have them? How did they turn out? How did you get the word out? Uh, I was fortunate to people volunteer their homes, whether it's oh. in Montecito and Santa Barbara, and oh, they invite yes. their friends. <clears throat> to come. That is smart. So you had people in, in their homes instead of go renting a hall or something like that. Yeah, and people come and they ask me questions and I'll, I'll give them my direct, honest answer. And um, you learn a lot from those, those um, type of house greetings. So the friend, let's just say you have a friend and uh, that person invite you to have a little meeting in their home. Mm -hmm. And so then, <clears throat> would that friend do a lot of the inviting of other people? Yes, yes they would. They invite their circle friends, who will invite other friends. So uh, about 30 to 50 people per gathering. So, and it works. You do one a week times X amount of weeks and you can reach a lot of people. So, you were a really busy guy. I mean, you're, I think you like being busy. You're <laughs> always busy. It, it, it keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think so. So um, what would you say to young people who might be considering uh, be, becoming a public servant of some sort? I tell anybody who wants to serve, not just young, but anybody is to you know, ask yourself why you want to mm -hmm. be in this position. I tell them, don't do it because you want it to be a career. Do it because you want to serve and do what's right for the community. Because once it's a career, it becomes something else. Um, giving is receiving, that's how I see it. And, to, and when I'm in Carpentria, I see our community happy, um, safe. Uh -huh. And to see them thriving, it makes me, it, it makes me say, I've done a decent job. Well, that's great, yeah. So anyone wanting to run, make sure they're doing it for the right reasons. Exactly, and ask your spouse or your family first, because it impacts them too. Because what I'm doing now impacts my wife, my family. Because my wife, she has been, you know, I love you, Tina. <laughs> she has been just the foundation of this for me to build on. Without her, I wouldn't be here today. So um, my wife, my family just, uh, they make me want to do better. So in your wife, Tina, that's mm -hmm. her name, right? Um, so she's at the restaurant every day working. Yes. And she's a hard worker. Her, her and I come from similar backgrounds. We both came from Taiwan, uh, from, you know, hardworking families. So we know what it's like to, to struggle, to go through hardship. Is that where you met in Taiwan? No, actually, she came from school. When she came from school at age 18, I picked her up from the airport. And uh, we became friends. And we've known each other for over 25 years. We've been Gosh. married 18 now. So. 18 years, wow. It goes fast. Yeah. <laughs> and you've got three children. Three children. Uh, my son Tyson, 17, Madison, 14, Ellie, 11. Okay. So. And, uh, okay, so here you come over. Uh, how old were you when you came from Taiwan? So I was six years old when I came to Taiwan. Six years old. And I still remember the day we came. We were at LAX, <clears throat> and everybody looked different. Nobody understood what I was saying. I couldn't <laughs> communicate with anybody. It was, it was different. And we moved to Gurita, is where I, from 86 to 99, is where I grew up. So, so <clears throat> you're, you're just a little kid, six years old. So of course you were surprised because you were used to everybody understanding what you were saying. And now all of a sudden these people look different and they didn't understand you. Yeah, exactly. I, as an immigrant, I understand that you know, the, the hardships that they go through because I'm a new kid. I was a skinny, I was the only Asian kid in school for many, many years until high school. Really? So I didn't know where I fit in that. And I had to learn English and the culture. And it was, it was hard. But we worked, but you know, my mom and dad always there. My brother was always there to support. Um, I was fortunate to have good friends uh -huh. who, who stood up for me. When I couldn't, oh. so I was bullied. I was, I was definitely. Uh, it tested me a lot. 
So your brother, is he older or younger? He's older by two years. He's a oh. mailman, Carp, my brother Brian. Ah. Amazing guy. Everybody loves him. Yes, I've heard everybody loves him. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's a hard worker. He, uh, he's a good role model. And your mom and dad, mm -hmm. tell us about them. So my mom and dad both are, uh, came from farming backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, they sought a better life, so they took that chance. Um, they were sponsored to come to the United States, and they took that risk to leave everything behind. And we came to this country with very little. We were poor, um, but we worked hard and we saved. My parents never complained. Um, but everything that we have today, we, we achieved it ourselves. And we're grateful for that. So, you know, I hear you talking often about hard work. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you learned that from your family. Yes. And uh, compromise mm -hmm. and listening. Yes. And so I think you paid close attention. Yeah. Your mom and dad probably helped teach you that. They did. I started work at the age of 14. And being in a restaurant, you need help. It's hard to find employees, so what's better employee than your kids? So it was go to school and then go to work. And this I, was at the restaurant? Yes. Okay. I carry on throughout my, to this day. That's, it shows you what, what's important in life, the priorities, your family, your business, and making sure that it stays successful. Now it seems like, I remember you saying one time that your dad, your father, um, what was, oh, when he was 12 years old, mm -hmm. he quit school so he could have a job and support the family. You're right. He's a second of 12 kids. The so, second of 12 kids. Wow. So going to school in Taiwan during the time was a luxury. Oh. My mom graduated high school, which is unheard of for a lot of families. But for my dad, he had to quit school at an early age to start working to feed the family. That was his responsibility and sacrifice that he took. And um, I'm grateful for what he has done. Do they come to the restaurant? My mom, they would still work every single day. Really? Your mom works in the restaurant every day? Every day. We try to cut the hours, but it's what they love. We don't see it as work. It's, we see it as spending time with the family, mm -hmm. and talking oh. to customers, uh, keep ourselves busy. And we, we love what we do. That's, that comes through loud and clear. <laughs> it seems like I heard you say that you learned to cook from your mom and dad. Yes, yes I did. So two different styles. My dad is more a stronger flavor type of cooking, high heat. My mom's lower, more uh, gentle, gentle flavors. So I'm in the middle. I learned from both of them how to cook and I've been doing that for over six, oh, eight years now. I'm in the kitchen every single day. You're in the kitchen every day. And as well as the front. So aside from when I started off washing dishes, I learned to be a busboy mop the floors, do paperwork, pay the bills. Yeah, I learned all the aspects of running a business. And now being in the kitchen, which is challenging in itself, you learn to remain calm when the pressure is at the highest. Mm. So imagine Christmas, right? Oh gosh, yeah. Everyone wants the food, they want it now, the 10 minutes ago, and you have a three hour wait. You just, you learn to work under pressure. Oh gosh. And just remain calm. Oh, and just remain calm. That's an important lesson, I'd say, for being a supervisor. <laughs> it is, because if I'm stressed out and angry, it shows you employees that, oh, something's wrong. So you always have to just compose yourself. Can you think of a time when um, you felt yourself getting stressed out and you had to have a little talk with yourself to calm down? Or tell me how that works for you inside your head. There's many times, uh, a lot of the lessons I've learned in life is at the restaurant, whether it's dealing with a difficult customer, oh. someone who's, uh, who's just having a bad day and taking on you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a saying at the restaurant, right or wrong, always choose kind. And that's our approach to not just restaurant, but life. Um, kindness does, does, does help. So to be kind, no matter what. Because you don't know how other people are going through their day. Yeah. They could be having bad days, so you're not there to make it worse. You want to just be kind. Well, good for you. That's an important lesson for everyone, I think. Yes, I hope people, more people do that, especially this month is Mental Health Month. And oh, yeah. uh, recently we had an event with HopeNet, 
and mm -hmm. talk about mental illness and treat people with kindness. Yeah. I heard somebody say one time, um, or I've read it many times, I guess, mm -hmm. do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? <laughs> Both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most people want to be right as well as happy. What about your kids? Do they work in the restaurant from time to time? We had the discussion. Uh, I want them to focus on the education and mm -hmm. sports. Yes. I, my son, <laughs> next year will be senior, he'll be deciding where to go to college. I tell him, go to any college you want, travel the world, do things that you want to, and just live your life. Don't worry about us, we'll be fine. Um, I don't want to say it's nothing, it was something that wasn't given to us, but we were, have expectations that we had to go work. That yeah. We have to stay here, that we shouldn't go out and seek other careers because family was the priority. So mm -hmm. I want to make sure my kids give opportunities that we necessarily did not have. So do you <coughs> think your kids are learning um, the importance of hard work and listening and compromise, all those lessons that you learned early and so well, do you think your kids are learning that? Yes, <clears throat> yes, because uh, I like to lead by example. Mm -hmm. Show my kids, don't give up. Hard work, you can't achieve everything that you want, as long as you, you know, just be honest, be truthful, just be yourself, and you can achieve anything that you, you will like. It's not easy though, nothing should be easy. Yeah. That's why it's called hard work. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, <clears throat> as you look forward to the coming year, or maybe two, mm -hmm. um, what, what would you like to look back on uh, during your term uh, that you say, oh man, I'm proud of this. I accomplished that. What, what are you looking forward to? As the end of this term as supervisor coming mm -hmm. up, I want to, people to know that I was someone who was honest, accessible, dependable, someone who they could call and get a response and keep the promises. Mm. I will keep my promises issues such as dealing with cannabis, dealing with housing, addressing mental health, homelessness, and something I'm advocating for is animal welfare. Mm. Uh, I took a tour of the animal county shelters and we could do better. I'm a huge animal lover, I have two dogs, they're my, they're my best friends. Aww. And I want to do much better for our dogs and cats and horses and rabbits and all our animals. So I want to advocate that on the board of supervisors that we need more funding for the shelters, mm -hmm. better policy treatments for the animals. That's something that I strongly feel passionate about. That's good. So what kind of dogs do you have? I have a Jack Russell and a Belgian Malinois. So a Jack Russell and a? And a Belgian Malinois, oh. like a Belgian Mal. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's like shepherd, but smaller, yeah. crazier. <laughs> Jump fences, <laughs> hates oh. mailmen. <laughs> oh, wow, that but, sounds great. But they're, they're amazing, they're just so happy to see you. And as any dog lover knows, they're just the family and where they treat them as family. Gosh. So, okay. Um, so you're looking forward to, to that, but what about the issues? Let's talk about some issues that are kind of in the forefront of your mind uh, as you move into this new position of yours. Uh, the pressing issues is, is cannabis, dealing with the, the smells and odors. I think that's priority that we need to focus on and address and not force it to be done in a, in a wrong way. We have to put in carbon, carbon scrubbers to get rid of the smell. Mm. It works, it has proven to work, and we need, that is what the board supervisors need to address. Uh, going forward, the conversation about housing will dominate the conversation for the next 10 years, if not longer, in this county. So there's, there's a lot of different ideas, but we cannot let private developers run the show. We have the government has to take, take the stance. We have to take the lead on that. You know, one idea is to create this affordable housing trust fund. Like it's a pot of money mm -hmm. that we start saving and we see a say, say piece of land, we buy it, work with nonprofits such as people self-housing, uh -huh. housing authority and build truly affordable workforce housing that we need for everybody from working at coffee shops to our teachers or first responders. Yeah. That's very important. So your idea with that 
you know, everyone agrees that's so important, but it sounds like um, one of your first steps is going to be to ask questions and listen to people and their needs for housing. It, it is. Uh, for the past eight months since the election, I really got out there and really learned <clears throat> housing, not just for our community, but for businesses, mm -hmm. is also a priority. Uh, Kaj Hospital, Casa de Renda, um, all these big entities need housing for their employees. So we have to think of creative ways outside the box to accomplish that, to provide housing in a way that kind of preserves our identity in Santa Barbara and Carpinteria and the surrounding neighborhoods. So as you look at your fellow supervisors, um, would you say they're kind of all in agreement about that issue or maybe they're not in agreement about how to approach it or do you see that no that's something that we're we're all gonna work on together and and agree mostly so i met all the supervisors i met uh, steve bob uh, laura and joan amazing you know yes, i highly respect them and i think the mentality going in is we're here to get things done like gsd get yeah. stuff done as Steve said, GSD. GSG. Get stuff done. Usually the S I is like a that. four letter word, but you know, I want to. <laughs> but we're here to really solve issues. You know, get rid of the politics, let's pave our roads, let's focus on housing, homelessness, mental health. These really things that impact people in our community. Yeah. And the recent conversation about farmers' wage, I'm glad that was yes. held. Yes. You know, we can look at not just about wages and have that discussion, but the conditions on how they the working conditions, mm -hmm. as well as the farmers. You hear about farmers, about regulations. Let's talk about those too. What regulations do they want to discuss and take away possibly so we can focus on those issues. So I think there's a win-win for both sides, all sides. Well, and the good news is you bring the perspective of a, a business owner from your restaurant. I mean, you know what's important there as well as caring about the other side those the, the workers it is because and our our employees we treat them as family mm -hmm. you know uh, simone has been there for over 30 years and we have other employees 15 10 years and we treat them with respect and i think every employer should treat that with the employees so i do understand when i was younger i was an employer, employee now an employer yeah. so i i understand Sounds like we're pretty lucky to have <laughs> you there in that position. Thank you. Let's go back to the cannabis thing for a minute. So is Carpinteria the only city that has a problem with the odor and other cannabis issues? So the odor is, is the main issue in Carpinteria. And the location is where it's being grown. Next to people's homes and schools. That was wrong. Um, it shouldn't have been done. Unfortunately, we cannot go back in the past and change it. We just have to move forward. And dealing with the smell is the priority. And other counties, the North County, San Inez, does have conflict with cannabis. Mm -hmm. But I'm not here to be against any industry. I just want to do business right. Yeah, do and business right. We just have to do it the right way and just solve this odor smell and then work from there. So the scrubbers solve that. Is that right? It does. It does work. It has to be proven to work. And I toured two farms, two mm -hmm. cannabis farms, one with Carbon scrubbers and one without. Oh, good for you. So the one with my clothes came out smelling great. And uh, I think it just, I learned a lot. Then I tore the one without. My clothes, I had to actually take it off, take a shower, and I was nause feel nausea for over two days. Really? I did. So why would somebody not want to put scrubbers? Are they expensive or what? All the above. I think cost is a big one. Uh, the availability. Um, but everybody has an excuse, but no more excuses. We need to put in carbon scrubbers, and we need to do it now. What percentage of the cannabis, what do you call them, grows? Or, mm -hmm. uh, have scrubbers versus don't? A lot. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure exact numbers, but a very minority of the growers actually do have. So the majority does not. Oh. And we need to change that and mandate it. So imagine a restaurant without... Uh, grease traps mm. without air ducts. It's gonna affect the neighborhood. Yeah. And you can't do that. Okay, so cannabis, housing. Uh, Mental health and homelessness. Okay. Those are huge. 
um, issues that we all need to work together. I don't think any one person has the answer. Uh, dealing with homelessness, I always tell myself this, homelessness is not a problem, it's a person. Mm. And we always have to remember that, that there's somebody's father, son, daughter, uh, spouse. So imagine my family member being there. I want them to be tr treated respectfully. So, and, and there's incredibly nonprofits such as Dignity Moves that does a comprehensive way of helping people experience your homelessness. Because it's not just the people that you see in encampments, it's people sleeping in the cars who have jobs. Yeah. Right? It just, the cost of living here is so high that it's challenging. And we need to help those individuals to find places where they can feel safe, where they're given resources, mm -hmm. and give them a chance to do better so that they will get out yeah. of homelessness and um, ha find a place to live. And with services about food, um, uh, just programs. There are the people who find themselves without a home. And then there are the businesses um, that a lot of times, especially on State Street, uh, are challenged with the homeless being around and discouraging customers. Yeah. And then um, they're just the, the regular people in town who are uncomfortable when they see a bunch of homeless people. So how, you know, how do you balance all of that? You have to work with the law enforcement. You work with law enforcement. I think that's key. Um, nonprofits going out there. Mm -hmm. So the way we do it in Carpentaria, we have a team. We reach out to each person and ask them, how can I help you? Okay. And over time, you build trust. Eventually, they'll be like, you know, I want help. I want to go to the housing. I want services. So it, it takes time, but it can happen. And oh, it, it does work. I like the idea of starting with caring for each individual, regardless of their story or situation. Because most of us are just a few pay checks away from being homeless ourselves. You know, we have students that are homeless. Right. Like sleeping in the cars. It happens. I've seen it. Yeah. So we need to give them a chance. You know, they are successful stories. And let's work hard to make sure there's more of those. Mm -hmm. So homelessness, um, housing, uh, cannabis, mental health. mental health. Let's talk about that. Now, with the challenge of Prop 1 taking money away from the county for mental health services, yes. that is going to be a challenge that we will face. But the good thing is there are grants out there that we can apply for. And funding is key to make sure that uh, mental health services are there. But letting the public know about things such as... Um, numbers that you can call in case you do have a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. um, the number is 888-868-1649. I believe I'm right. I don't know. For you. Or eight, yeah, uh, 866 is the three number code. So th those numbers can help. You know, you have professional individuals who come out and really um, can address it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's there. You just got to find it. That's if something's happening, but maybe to get out um, in front of that before something happens, what about, you know, mental health um, prevention, let's say? So, it, it, so everything's connected, whether uh, the Santa Barbara Superior Court, the DA's office, public defenders, uh, the county, all that is connected because your goal is first to prevent arrest. You, you want to make sure that the person who have is mentally ill, do not go to jail because jail does not help people with mental illness. It makes it worse. You want to get them into programs, prevention, um, diversion court to make sure that they are in places where they need to be. Because mm -hmm. jail is reserved for the bad people, right, who committed yeah. crimes. So that's, and also it fills up the bed really fast. So we want to divert court, diversion court. All righty. And then, um Animal welfare, that's another thing that you're very interested in. It is. So I took tour of the Santa Barbara County um, off Turnpike. Uh -huh. I went to the Lompoc one and Santa Maria one. It was hard. Uh, when I left each one, I was very upset. You know, you see these German shepherds in spaces that they can barely stand, let alone lie. Oh. And that's where they, you know, deficit and pee and eat. Yeah. You know, the stress for these animals is just so great. So when I left, it was just, 
incredibly upset. Then I had a chance to go to a place called um, Shadows Fund. It's 100 acres in Lompoc, and it's dedicated to animals, dogs, pigs, horses, and much more. Gosh. And they built these animals like a house, basically, <laughs> with TV, sofas, and they let them oh. live their lives. And that philosophy is just, wow. So I was in the back of the truck, just driving there and learning so much. And what they do is amazing. And organizations, nonprofits such as Santa Barbara Humane Society are just so good at what they do. And I just respect Carrie, and she, she's a CEO, director. Yes. They do so great things for animals, and I highly respect them for everything yes. they have done and continue to do with animals. So we just have to all come together and um, just do much more. Yeah, Carrie does a great job, doesn't she? And her team. Oh, yeah, I toured it, and you know, just you know, I can't thank her enough for what she does. Yeah, and they, they give it their best with you know, what they have to work with. And uh, I'm sure they're hopefully learning some lessons from these other people, but those other people have a big giant space to work with. Yes, and uh, there's much more. I'm learning more about animal services in, in our county, and I want to. I, I want to go out there and learn as much as I can. And, and you uh, oh, got to where you really cared about that, what, from your own dogs? It is. I, ever since growing up, I always had dogs. Oh. And uh, the, the last time I cried was when I lost my dog, oh. about four years ago, uh, Jojo. He was a beach on freeze, 20 years old. And I remember that day when he, that was hard. You know, anybody who lost an animal understands. Um, you never forget, so. Yeah. Any other issues we should be talking about? Those are the major ones, but, um, but just being responsive, you know, with government is important. Yes, being responsive. It is. It's who I want a representative. I want someone who's responsive, someone who uh, answers the phone or through email. That's who I want. And so what does being responsive look like to you? So if someone calls me or emails me, within 24 hours, I want to... 24 hours. Yeah, I want a response. I want to respond to them. That's great. That, that's a good uh, sort of rule of thumb to have, yeah, 24 I, hours. I'll, I'll, try, um, I'll try my best. Um, but I, it's definitely doable. Yeah. When you look back at your campaign, mm -hmm. um, what kind of campaign promises did you make and which ones are you looking forward to and, and which ones uh, do you think might be a little bit, <laughs> a bit of a challenge to fulfill? Yeah. Uh, the elevator speech I give during the campaign, anyway, it's about preserving our community, preserving what we love, but about our open space. Okay. Our environment is something that Oh, I, uh, that's so important, right? The Santa Barbara, especially for the district, is the birthplace of the environmental movement. Protecting our environment is key. Right. right. And in Carpentaria is always something that we take priority with, you know, preserving our bluffs. That's something that, that is important to me, and I will make sure that I keep those promises. Yeah. And dealing with cannabis, going back to that, mm -hmm. is also a type priority. It will be done. Um, and I'll do my best to make sure that it's done well. What are the areas uh, that District 1 encompasses? So District 1 is Carpentaria, the Valley, uh, Summerland, Montecito, majority of Santa Barbara, East Side, West Side, Riviera, and Cuyama. Wow. Yeah. That, that's really big. Yeah, Cuyama just, yeah, it just... Is, are the other areas, uh, or districts, I should say, are they a similar size, or is your Yours bigger than most. Uh, that's a good question. I think we're, we're all the, about the same population. Oh, really? But Kuyama just kind of... Yeah, that's out there. I don't know how to get gerrymandered in, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I, down the road, I'll go up there and learn about the farming community and the community as a whole yeah. and how I can help them. What are the concerns that you've heard from the people in each one of those areas of the district? So we we'll start with uh, Kuyama is about water farming representation. They felt like they're being left left out. Oh, well, of course, because they're so far away. So far away, and I want to change that and have a me monthly meetings. And the same with Sumlin, right? They felt they haven't been heard. Oh, I, I'm changing that too. I want to have a closer relationship. And then on Santa Barbara, on the west side, we talk about flooding. We talk about you know, improvements to the streets. 
uh, dealing with homelessness, mental health, and the East Side too. Um, with the recent Boys and Girls Club, um, mm -hmm. Mark, Mark Alvarado is taking over. It gives a great opportunity for him and us to turn that space into for our youth. Mm -hmm. so, so areas such as the Milpas, streets improvement, better lighting, safety. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Mosito, you, <laughs> you have the Hot Springs Trail, right? You have... Um, oh gosh, that's a big, that's a big one, isn't uh, it? Yeah, oh, public safety is always key. Yeah. You always have to focus on that. Dealing with projects such as the Rosewood, the Biltmore, uh, Music Academy, Casa Dorenda, who has potential things coming up. Um, I'm going out there and meeting them and listening to all sides. You probably, your first year is probably going to be full of learning, lots of learning. And I look forward to it. I, I, I love learning. I love listening, going out there and meeting new people. It's, it's been one of the best experiences I had. Gosh. And so, all right, so you seem to understand the main issues of each part of your district. And yet here you'll be a supervisor of Santa Barbara County. Mm -hmm. So how will you balance the needs of your district? Well, balancing the needs of all the parts of your district is a big enough job. But how would you balance the needs of your district with the whole county? Um, learning. Learning about the other parts of the county, the second, third, fourth, and fifth district. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went up north and I spent the day learning about farming mm. in North County. I went to Santa Maria, Orchid, uh, Guadalupe. I had just never been there and it was great to learn about um, what they need and how I can help. It's different up there. You don't see electric vehicles, you don't see charging stations, you don't see people riding their bikes as much. You see more just more, from what I saw, more gas stations, more laundromats. Oh. Just different. But this is what I, just different kind of life. So I want to make sure the policies I set here will affect the North County in a positive way and not negative, yeah. and vice versa. So working with us supervisors, I think there's always compromise where we can meet and work together to establish better policies for everybody. When you go up to places like that, are they surprised to see you or do they already know that you're coming or? I, I try to let people know I'm coming uh -huh. and I try to hold meet and greets. Okay, and well, that's good. I just want to listen and hear from what they want. And for a lot of people say they just want to be heard. Yeah. They just want a different supervisor from uh, South County to really just work with them and not necessarily because they know they won't always get what they want, but as yeah. long as someone listens, this is what they appreciate. So do you have somebody making those arrangements for you? Do you have a team that you work with? I try to do it myself, but I do uh, my chief of staff, Wade Cooper. He, he helps set it up. Oh, uh, good. Wade is, he's, well, he's an amazing person. Um, I trust him, I respect him. He's my yin to my yang, and we work well together, and I'm excited to have him with me um, through the experience. That's great. Yeah. How did you find Wade? How did you meet him? I, I called a friend and um, I didn't have a campaign manager when I first started. It was just me, myself, and I. <laughs> so I called a friend and she said, I know somebody. A couple of days, a couple of days later, Wade came and he's like, I'm going to be your campaign manager. I said, okay. So did you know right away that you and Wade would sort of click? We did. Uh, you can always feel that you have this, you have this good uh, partnership the moment that you met this person. But it was not easy. We had a lot of challenges, um, you know, raising money, getting the word out. It was, my campaign was a David versus Goliath kind of campaign, right? Yeah. You know, you have this, this politician that has all the money, the name recognition, um, support, and me, just in Carpentria, just... Roy, who? Just, exactly. <laughs> and we worked hard, it was, it, it, it was not easy, <laughs> but we prevailed. And I yes, remember, you did. I remember election night. We have a hundred people at the restaurant, and um, the first batch came out, and it was like wow. And Wade was just—he, I never see a guy so happy. <laughs> he was yelling. He was—he was very excited. And, um, so Wade was maybe. I mean, he really didn't know you in the beginning, and so he was maybe a little bit brave taking this on, since since not many people knew who you were, and and the and your opponent, like everybody knew who he was. 
That's right, and uh, I thank them for that. I thank you for believing in me. Um, a lot of people didn't even give me a chance to to think like, this guy had no chance. And um, but you know, it shows you if you work hard, good yeah. things can happen. And so um, you also have what you call a kitchen cabinet that helped you with the race, and maybe you still, you know, go and talk things over with them. I do. I do have amazing. They're more than friends. There. I treat them as family. Mm -hmm. uh, George Dudley, Barney Milinkian, Pat McElroy, and former supervisors that are just being great advisors. Uh, Janet Wolf, mm -hmm. Peter Adams, uh, Gail Marshall, yeah. uh, Brooks Firestone. These are oh. former supervisors who oh. has been such, they're so diverse, but they've been through there, so they understand and they give me great advice about um, how to be the best supervisor that you can. And hearing from both sides and every side is important because they understand. So did you know all of these folks beforehand or you just kind of got uh, to know them afterwards? Half and half. Of most I knew beforehand, but during the campaign afterwards, I got to know them and became friends. And uh, they're amazing people. They just, they yes, care. they are. They care about the county. They care about the people. And they want me to succeed. So I'm fortunate to have them in my life. And Barney Malikian, he's part of your kitchen cabinet too. Yeah, Barney right? is amazing. He's just, he's such an inspiration and a role model to me. I'm very, uh, I'm very fortunate. Yeah, so mostly it was Barney, Joyce, and Pat were sort of the main ones. And then you very wisely added a larger group to sort of advise you. Yes, and uh, you know, people, um, Lois Caps. Lois Caps, I just, I met her and she's just amazing. I, uh, I look up to her a lot too. Yeah. So to have her um, give me advice about life and, and current, uh, also Salute Carver Hall, right? oh. Greg Hart, Monique oh. Nimong, it's just, oh, wow. Oh yes, oh like, yes. Like the dream team, they just, yep. yeah, I'm very, uh, I met with each and one of them and they, they are the best at what they do, so. Gosh, you are so smart, so wise to reach out to all these people, ask questions, learn, work hard. Boy, you, you really have all the answers that you, seems like you learned coming up, learning the hard way. It is, and uh, if I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll try to find it. Because I don't know everything in life. The more you think you know, the more you realize you don't know. <laughs> I don't know all, all the answers to all the questions but I'll try to find out. Yeah, well, I have a feeling that all of your constituents and more okay. will be so glad that you were elected in this uh, stunning upset, really. <laughs> and I want people to know that I come in this role as a customer-based kind of mentality. Uh, like a restaurant, you come in, you have an issue, well, I'm here to help, how yeah. can I help you? And that's a mentality I will bring to the board. How can I help? So you come in really, you know, as a server, as a server in the restaurant. Yeah. I'm here to serve you. Yeah. And that seems to be your mindset, and that's fabulous. Yeah, if, you, if your cup is half empty, don't fill it up kind of mentality. And so it's what I've known since I was a kid, and yeah. that's what I want to do, serve, literally serve. And, um, you know, no job is too big or too small. I will continue to be who I am. And my wife would tell me if I ever change, so she's a... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, we have a few minutes left. So what else would you like for our audience to know about Roy Lee? I just want to tell them that, to contact me. If oh. you have an issue, if you have any problems, contact me directly. I will respond. Um, yeah, you can find me currently at my city address. But down the road, I will have my phone number and my uh, county email. Mm -hmm. So I invite people to come and just, if they want to sit down for coffee or if they want to meet me or have any issues they want to discuss, I have an open door policy. Even if they're not in your district, you want to hear from them? Anybody, throughout the whole county. Uh, I want to learn as much from the North County as I do from the South. Mm -hmm. Because like I said before, policies that I've set here will affect them and I want to do it in the right way, it would be positive. Yeah, you know, when I read the papers, it seems like a lot of people 
in the North County feel like maybe they're kind of outnumbered by the number of supervisors serving the South County and I don't know, everybody looks at things from their own vantage point. So what you're saying I think will be a breath of fresh air for them. It is, well, it's what I learned on the City Council of Inquiry. We have to work together as a team. That's the way we get things done. If we always have this divide, it will always be bad for the community. So working with other supervisors now, I want them to know that I'm here to work as a team, not as uh, like uh, groups. So I'll listen to anybody. I keep an open mind. So I'm here to work, work, work with people, not against them. Mm -hmm. So I want people to know that. So. I just want to go back to your kids for a minute. One, the oldest is 17. Yes. 14, 14 and 7. And 11. 11. Yes. 11. And so they all go to Carpinteria schools. Yep. Uh, my son's a junior, daughter's a freshman, and a sixth grader. All local Carp High, Carp Middle School. Mm -hmm. And so you're encouraging your uh, oldest to um, look at colleges and travel and what if he comes and says dad I'm not going to go to school the first year I'm just going to travel 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 and then I'll go to school what what would you think of that I said do it oh <laughs> do, it. do just go out there and, and learn um, I cannot tell my kids what to do I I want I'll be there to support them in their decision because I understand what it be young ones I don't know what to do I know what I never expected to be in the supervisor role. I, I keep, you kind of grow into that, into that space. So I want him to, if he wants to travel, do it. If he wants to become um, a accountant, a lawyer, a doctor, do it. I'll support my kids and whatever they want to do. So even though they don't work in the restaurant, which is where you learned all of your lessons, you feel like uh, maybe they're carefully watching you and their mom to learn the lessons that you learned so well. Yeah, and uh, le leading by example, I think it works. Uh, my kids do see us working hard every day mm -hmm. and to see what we achieve. Um, so I, you know, I can say that we're proud that we achieved the American dream of home ownership, business ownership. And uh, my kids never really had to s see that struggle that was so difficult and that they have a chance to do much more than we could. So I tell my kids, do better than us. Mm -hmm. Go out there and you know, help people. Yeah. So that's, if they can do that then, and happy and uh, make a living, then I, I've done a decent job. I mean, it really sounds like you, while you and your wife learned um, all these important lessons um, the hard way coming up, when you were young and, and even now, uh, it sounds like your kids are learning the same lessons, but just in a different way by looking at your example. Yes, and uh, yeah, I don't want to brag, but my kids, they have 4.7 GPAs. Oh, gosh. They involve water polo. They, they're hard workers. So they achieve great things already themselves with me never telling them what to do. They just did themselves. And my daughter, Madison, She's going to become somebody. I can tell my daughter, Ellie, she's, she has a passion to help people. Yeah. So it kind of rubs off on them to do more than just um, the, the normal. They, they know what they want. Just getting there is, uh, will be the challenge for them. And getting there, they're going to need a lot of support. And it sounds like you and your wife give plenty of support and encouragement. We do, and uh, my kids are, are so important to me. So the things that I do, I want to make sure that we leave a better world for not just my kids, our youth, and to our seniors, to make sure that we listen to them and everybody between. Yeah. We want to make things better, not worse. Yeah, so I hear from you that you really want to make all of our communities better from the kids, all the kids, all the way to the seniors. Yeah, uh, as a kid, my mom and dad always taught me to respect your elders, listen to them, and, and it's, that's important. We have to teach more of that to our youth. Our uh, elders are 
are, are the pillars of the community. Yeah. Well, Roy, thank you so much. Huh. Gosh, I've just enjoyed this so much, and I know other people uh, will really enjoy getting to know you, and we're looking forward to seeing Roy in action for our county, especially District 1. Thank you, Cinder, and thank you for the experience. I appreciate it. Yes, and thank you for coming on the show to share all of your very inspirational insights with all of our audience. So it's a tradition of mine, you know, you know how Taylor Swift does friendship bracelets? Yes. Well, yes. I do this with our city pin, so I like to... Oh, Roy, thank you. Gosh, that's beautiful. City of Carpinteria, incorporated 1965. Yep. It's thank you. I will definitely proudly wear that. Thank you. That's a great... Um, hey, you and Taylor Swift, huh? <laughs> well, she has... Uh, yeah. <laughs> She's... Yeah. <laughs> Good. Thank you. It'll, it'll create on you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us on Community Conversations. We loved your story. Thank you. Thanks, Cinder. And thank you for joining us on Community Conversations, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.